So why does God allow evil? Part two is where we are today. We're going to part two. We're in the book of Romans, kind of an overall passage to start us out. Romans 5, 12, and I want to remind you of a simple truth. So you ready? I want you to say this verse with me, Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death spread to all men because all sinned, no matter how good you are. And again, I've, I've sometimes making a joke, but not that big of one. I think the best people in New Mexico are right here in this room. I am blessed to know you. You encourage me day after day. You've got sweethearts. You're intelligent people. But I love you, but all of you have made a mistake at some point. You're not perfect. You have sinned. No matter how good you are, you may be really close. But God puts a high mark, and that high mark is perfection, and none of us have made it. Because of that, one man kind of brought sin in. But Paul's going to be very clear that we're all responsible for this. We can't blame Adam Even though he's going to start there, he's going to remind us that we do the same thing. Because of this sin coming into the world, death worked its way in. Because we've all sinned, we all have to die. And again, we're into the kind of the the toughies, the difficult ones, the ones that aren't that exciting. I wish we were talking about fun things, but I'll see if I can keep it light for you. Remember last week we started this topic. And we were trying to deal with why God allows evil. We worked through a few possible choices, and I want to quickly remind you of what we talked about. You can go back and listen to the sermon if you want a little fuller explanation, but I think these few few words are going to get it to you. We were reminded last week that God could, if he wanted to, change everyone's personality where no one sins. We talked last week that God's holy, he's sovereign, he's omnipotent, he's beautiful, he's powerful. He doesn't want sin, and he has the ability to stop it. So from the beginning, uh, from day one with Adam, once Adam and Eve made their mistake, he could have quickly said, okay, this system isn't working. Let's go to something else. I'm not going to allow them to do this again because I want more for them. He could have done that. This would have mean that he essentially took away their free will. And that's for Baptists. You know, we tend to want to vote everything into existence. And because of that, again, that's what I love about this church. You guys just don't care about most of that stuff. But I've been in churches. We can't you know, vacuum the carpets without getting a good vote before we go. And so it's that kind of a thing. We want to vote ourselves into heaven, vote ourselves into these kind of things. That's the kind of people we want to be. But free will is an important thing. I'm not going to make light of it. We have the ability to choose God or we have the free will to choose away from him. And understanding the definition, and I'm not going to get into the subtleties there. If we lost our free will, we wouldn't be able to choose right or wrong because we would essentially be programmed only to do right. Had God chosen to do this, which he could have, there would be no meaningful relationship. Again, I don't have a a Roomba or Zumba vacuum, whatever those one little circular ones that run around. I think Zumba is an exercise class. So that's, you know, I think we have videos for Zumba, but I don't have a Roomba vacuum. But even if I did, I don't see me having a meaningful relationship with it. I kind of just want to kick it out of my way if it's in my way. Just vacuum when I'm not here, and I'll program it not to mess with me that way. So you can understand if God did that with us, it probably wouldn't be a great relationship. I mean, eventually he's going to be bored because he's hearing everything he wants to hear. You know, I I teach different classes at different universities, and I kind of like it when they challenge a, a thought. You know, at least they thought about it. Stand up to me. Don't just... Tell me what I want to hear. I want you to think through the problem. Right or wrong, I can't necessarily disagree with the answer if you thought the problem correctly, especially in classes like ethics. It's just tough. You know, the class may be split. But free will is everything. God didn't want to take that away. So we talked about that. We talked about that God could compensate for people's actions through some supernatural intervention. And I I want to remind you, it wasn't even my notes last week, that God does that for you daily. God does miracles in your life day by day, but it's because you love him and you spend time with him and he loves you. But as a, as a whole over humanity, he doesn't work that way, but he could have. While this solution sounds good, and it really does, let's just get rid of all the bad people. Let's get rid of all the problems. Let's just make it where they don't do these bad things. It would lose its beauty just as soon as God infringed on something we wanted to do. We talked about that. We want God to prevent those horrible evil things, but we're willing to let less evil things occur. 
And again, I don't know what shows you watch. I don't know anything about that. But it is a statistical point that pornography on the Internet drops by 3 to 5% when Game of Thrones comes on HBO. What does that mean? You work that out. Look at what you're watching. We want certain things in our lives, but we don't want anybody else doing bad things to us. Again, we want to let those little things occur. Should God only stop actual sexual affairs, or should he also block our access to pornography or any other type of thing that makes us have visions and dreams that way? Or should he even stop inappropriate relationships that aren't yet sexual? God knows three years later this person is going to do with this, with this, so I'll just make it where they never meet. Okay, our free will has gone. We've turned back into robots once again. We don't have that meaning relationship because we have no free will to choose away from God. Depending on, the, excuse me, depending on theological circles, free will has to do with moving away from God, not moving toward him. We were designed to be with him. We have the free will to choose away. Depends on how you look at it. Should God stop true thieves or should he steal, keep us from stealing pens out of the back of the church pews? I don't know. So we talked about that. Another good choice would be for uh, God maybe to judge and remove those who commit evil acts. And we th I thought this was the best. This one worked out the best. Let's just get rid of all the evil people. You know, those bad people doing the drug stuff, the bad people who are going to honk at me in my car when I didn't do anything wrong. I was totally innocent, and they're mad at me for something. But we were reminded again, the problem with this is there would be none of us left. All of us have sinned, and all of us are wrong, and where would God draw the line? So let's just remove us all. This church should be empty, even though I think you're the closest to that line there is. Church should be empty. We all sin. We commit evil acts. So let's consider the question again this morning. Maybe you look a little more with the angle of motives. Maybe why would God do this? You know, we understand that with reference to us, our free will. But maybe there's something more. We're in the book of Romans, so open up there. And as you're turning there, let me tell you a little bit about it. Who both wrote the book of Romans? Paul did, not the Romans. And so always remember that. Paul wrote this book somewhere in AD 57, near the end of his third missionary journey. If you look at it, Paul started at a certain spot. He would work his way out and come back. And he did this three separate times before the Lord took him home. And uh, the real theme of this book is right at the beginning, around 16 and 17 of chapter 1, the concept that God's offer of the gift of his righteousness to everyone who comes to Christ but through Jesus, comes to salvation through the faith of Jesus. That's the kind of theme of the book. You can have righteousness before God. You can be perfect and beautiful before his laws that he set out if all you do is accept his son. What a beautiful thing. Now, our passage this morning is one that you should know. If you know the Roman road, you at least know one of these verses this morning. We're in Romans 3, 23 and 24. So I want you to stand with me, please, as we honor God's word. It says this in verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you are good. And I thank you for these powerful verses. Lord, thank you for Paul writing them. Lord, thank you for your son that we have life this morning. Thank you that we can kind of understand maybe some of the purpose you do, Lord, and that you, you can talk to us and you will spend time with us educating us and reminding us of how good you are. We say this in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Excuse me. A little bit of backstory. Why would God allow evil? That's the overall question, and we've kind of answered it three or four ways. And again, you know, when we, we look at it, we can always answer the question, well, just God's beyond us. You know, anything we do, we can say that as the answer. Essentially, he doesn't stop evil because he has some great plan that we can't comprehend. Now, let's be honest. There are plenty of things about God we can't understand. Isaiah tells us off, awfully often about how much we don't know about God, Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God speaking himself. And your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, again, we need to understand we're a bit pretentious sometimes just by asking questions. Can we not just understand that God is bigger than we are and be content there? 
sometimes that's one of the most difficult positions in the Christian walk is understanding that God is just beyond us. And you know what? I may not solve this problem, but I trust and I have faith that he's good. When trying to understand God, we must live by faith and not by sight. So as you get these difficult questions in your life, and you're going to, you may have asked these questions yourself, and I've reminded you there's nothing wrong. The only sin occurs when we don't like the answer, and we tend to get frustrated. But there's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, please help me understand you better. Please tell me, how can this happen, Lord? In this world that we're in, how can this be the problem? But we need to understand Sometimes we just live by faith and not by sight. Habakkuk 2.4, look, his ego is inflated, which is where most of us are. We think we can understand an omnipotent, great, sovereign God. He is without integrity. That's essentially what the person is saying about the person who's questioning God. But the righteous one will live by faith. Is that you this morning? Are you righteous? Are you the one living by faith? I hope you are. Because you will at some point recognize you just don't have it all. Nothing irritates me. I've, I've met plenty of people, and I've got some in my own family in different areas of family that know everything. I get real tired. In three minutes, I'm worn out being around those people. You know, no one can know something about everything. No one can. And there's people that just love to talk and talk and talk and on and on. Sometimes the best thing is just sit and let us have some silence in the room together, and we'll all be happier, at least I will. So God's beyond us when you look at it. We need to have faith. But that's not the best way to answer a question. Sometimes we need to back up a little bit and think, now, what could God's motivations be? Understanding his word, understanding his son, seeing the examples that he set out before us, the great narratives of the Old Testament, the prophets, and the great wisdom writings, what why would God maybe do these things? Let's see if we can work it out. The first thing we need to understand this morning with reference to chapter 3 is that man rebelled against God. And we've, we've said this over and over again. We've got to be reminded that we're not that great. We all tend to think we're the most handsome, beautiful, smartest people out there. And they're all here in this room. But there's always going to be someone more handsome, more intelligent, more smart. So we need to understand that it's about God and not about us. All have sinned. Go back to verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. Every one of us. There's nothing hidden in the Greek. I know we would like to somehow make that caveat that's in the Greek. It's there. It talks about me being the one who's not in the all. But no, all of us have. We've all made a mistake. Every one of you, we all have. You may have only made one, but it was enough. And because of that, we're separated. The Old Testament says the same thing. Look at Isaiah 64 if you want to flip back there. But all of us have become like something unclean. And all our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. And Isaiah is pretty, being pretty clear, all of us. And he's including himself in that. All of us have made these mistakes. Isaiah is essentially the Paul of the Old Testament. I'm sure Paul would be frustrated. He, you know, he, Paul may think he's the Isaiah of the New Testament or something like that. It depends on how you look at it. But when it comes down to it, some of the deepest theolo- theology we see of the Old Testament is in the book of Isaiah. And sometimes it's the simplest words that are the deepest. All of us are like something unclean. All of us have lost our righteousness. Our, our best acts, the best thing that you can do is polluted rags and garments before the Lord. It doesn't encourage us, but it reminds us of who we are. And sometimes being humble is a good thing. Before God, that's always good. But we need to be reminded that the Lord sees us not as the beautiful thing without, without his son. With his son, we have beauty. He looks down on us with grace. Everyone sins, but you know, it's more than this when you look at it. Because we were born into sin, because of the acts of Adam and Eve, it's impossible in this world to keep from sinning. Paul's, Paul's not going to always write it off on Adam and Eve, but he's going to remind us that that's where it started. Right at the beginning, no one except for that one person, Jesus, has been able to come out of this world without a, a mistake. Only God has. Only Jesus and his son had the opportunity to do those beautiful things. The rest of us have done awful things. He's not going to blame Adam and Eve, but he's going to remind us that we're all guilty. 
Because we were born into sin, it's impossible not to sin. Look at Psalm 51. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. If this is David writing this, this is David understanding the truth that he made mistakes. And I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Now, again, I'm one who's going to take the entirety of God's word. Not just the New Testament is true and new and it's the fresh thing and that's the thing we look at. All of God's word is true. David is writing and reminding us that we're all sin, sinful from day one. Ephesians 2, 3. Let's go to the New Testament. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and our thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. Okay, so if I haven't set the pattern and, and let you understand truly where you are, maybe I, I don't know what else I can say. That's as clear as it gets. We can't do anything but sin. So essentially, we're utterly lost. We have no hope except for Christ. We were born into sin, and even if that weren't so, our nature is one that will cause us to sin. So even if we removed Adam and Eve, we're there. We can't be pure before God without his help. Hebrews 10.10 10, by this will of God, we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. If you want to truly understand who Christ is, read the book of Hebrews, but read it slowly and word for word. There's so much stuff there. It's just so rich, so, so rich. Christ allows us to be holy before him. Therefore, we can enter his presence again. Hebrews 10, 19, therefore, brothers, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. Now, that's just a snippet of a verse. You know, I don't like pulling anything out, but the context doesn't lead anywhere else but that. I mean, it's obvious we have the ability because of Christ to be bold before God. Now, understand you are still a created being. Don't go too bold. But you can be strong. You can come in. You can open your heart up before him. You can speak to a great and mighty God because he truly does love you. He loved you enough to send his son. And if you've accepted his son, he sees you as one of his children. Who wouldn't want their children coming in and spending time with him as a father? You know, I love that. And I love it when my kids will open up and they really do have a question. And, you know, they'll talk to me about things. And they know I'm not going to to berate them or, or look down on them. No, even if it's a goofy little crazy question, which most of them are, I'm going to act like it's the most important question in the whole wide world. And you know what? It's, it's important because I understand what you're saying there. Let's talk about that a minute. I'm going to esteem them in that. That's what God does. Again, without Christ, we are without hope. With Christ, you have life. You have a future. And if there's someone this morning who has, doesn't have Christ in their life, just right now say, Lord, I don't know who you are, but show yourself to me. Just show yourself. God will do amazing things in your life. And I would love to be able to celebrate with you as, as we see a new life changed. Right now you have no hope. God sees you with wrath. But you open up and you accept his son as being the, the one who gave his life for us. You will have hope. You will have future and an eternity with God the Father. So if God knows we have no ability yet to, but, but to sin, that's all we can do. Why does he let us do it? Why does God allow evil? Why can't he stop this thing? Why go to the Jesus extent? Why not just nip this thing when it starts? You know, again, let's get the simple solution. This seems like the hard way out. So why is there evil? When you look at it, we can take some different approaches on this. God may be letting evil run its course in order to prove that it's something like a cancer and that he's the only doctor who can cure it. You know, you look at it. I mean, I know some sweet people in this room who have gone through that and are going through cancer right now. They're wrestling with those issues. And God is your only heal, healer. Jehovah, Jehovah Rapha, mighty healer, God our healer, Yahweh. He's, he's the one who can do these things. God's the mighty doctor. I mean, without that doctor, we die. It allows us to truly see the potential that he has to give us hope in a life where there is no hope. If you're going through one of those difficult trials right now and you're waiting for tests to come back or, or whatever it is, you need to understand that God is your hope, not the results of those tests. We're all going to leave this world at some point. God gives you the true joy. This is the shadow as you look at the book of Revelations. This life is the shadow. It's that future that's the true life. That's what's going to be glorious. That's what's beautiful. Now, we want to be as long as we can down here because we have the opportunity to do so much more. 
But God, when you look at it, he gave Adam dominion over the world. When Adam rebelled against God, he set into motion this entire series of events. It changed nature. It changed creation. Both. Everything that was made and created at that point was affected. No longer was creation a paradise, but it, now it has thorns. It has thistles. It, walk out there without your feet on that dirt out there. You'll see what the world's turned into, let me tell you. Walk out there with shoes and they'll be totally covered. That's a perfect example of what should be beautiful. We should have apple trees and lush green grass, zoysia grass out there that high. Instead, we've got dirt and thistles. That's the world we're in. That's what we brought by our sin. People became sinner, sinners. We became, became haters of God. The only conclusion to such a situation like this has to be death. But the great God, the great doctor can ensure that we don't have death. He can ensure that we will live. He is perfect. God is gracious, Matthew 24. Unless those days were limited, no one would survive. But those days will be limited because of the elect. I'm going to make sure that there's only a certain period of time that these people can sin, and then I'm going to come back and take care of it. When my people are mine, then we go. It's all over. We've taken care of these things. So God has used people like liars and perjurers and you and me to bring his son to the cross. We might have the opportunity for eternal life. God is allowing evil so that he can be shown as the healer, and he healed us through his son, Jesus. I don't know. Just kind of spitballing this morning. Whether you like that or not, i got a few other, other angles we can go at it. When you look at it, God's not stepped away from fallen creation. He stepped right into it, into the middle of it. He saw it was a mess, and he said, i got to get in there in the middle of that and solve this problem. God's proving his sovereignty over evil and suffering and the rebellious people that all of us are. And he proves that essentially sin is utterly futile. You know, I've, I've got this thing solved. My blood can take care of this. God shows his power. He takes a broken system and he can fix it using the broken rules that we have already set up for ourselves. Only the doctor can heal, Matthew 9, 12. But when he heard this, he said, those who are well don't need a doctor, but the sick do. And all of us are sick without Christ. We're healthy and strong. No matter what this body may be doing, we've all got the aches and pains, and every day as we get older, we get find another one somewhere. We've all got those. But it's not about that. The doctor has healed us permanently. We have this beautiful future ahead. So when we look at it, man rebelled against God. The second thing, man came up short. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God has set a bar that needs to be reached. This is, it's a simple bar. It's perfection. Simple bar. Easy enough. If you want to pass this class, you must make 100.00%. In our world, essentially, we give medals to everyone. Now, nothing makes me frustrated more than when my kids get a medal and they ain't done anything at all to earn that medal. We work hard in our family, and I expect my kids to work hard to, to, make, to, to get through this life. Life is not going to be easy. They get up to be 12, 15 years old. You're not going to be getting a medal. The whole world's going to be beating on you. So prepare now. I want you to work hard. You get a medal when you've done really well. But we tend to do that. We don't keep score in little kids' games. We award the least talented so they won't feel bad about themselves. Now, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just not. I'm kind of showing what the world is. And so please don't beat up me any more than I'm going to be beat up. But you know, if God were to do this, everyone would go to heaven. He doesn't. He's pretty clear you all made a mistake. You goofed up. You're off. You're wrong. It's clear that way. When it comes down to it, for God, only perfection like his perfection will allow you into heaven. Even getting a high 98. I mean, we've got some college people in here. You started college? Have you got 90-ish? Did you say ish? Okay. Have you got nothing but A's? Yes. That's what we want to hear. Have you got 100%? Okay, see, but you got a high A, so we'll take it. We think you're great because of that. So hang in there. You keep being the example for the rest of us. But when it comes down to it, we have to get 100%. We have to get 100%. Nothing else counts. We, we just saw the Olympics. I mean, I, you know, it's, I've been very depressed about our country because of who we've become. You know, you, 
everything's about bathroom privileges at this point. Have we not got anything bigger to look at in the world? And so, but it was, I was very proud to be an American for a few minutes when we looked at the Olympics and we beat everybody else by 50 or so medals. That was fun. I wish we would have whipped them all, every medal. But that's just James coming out and not showing my grace for the other countries. But when you look at it, we've got three medals when you, uh, when you go to the Olympics. You've got the gold, the silver, and the bronze. We've got a first, second, and third. So essentially, second and third, not the first winner, gets an award. I guess that's nice. But when you look at it, and God probably didn't say this, this is me interpreting what I look at. In God's race, second place is first loser. There's no second place in God's, in, in God's economy, in his race. You either fall, stand up to the mark or you have failed. And I cannot spend time with you. This is what God is. This is the example that we're to look, so, look, at, look to. So if you sinned only once, you failed. It's not. You, there's no way you're going to get again. It was enough to keep you from God's presence by that one mistake. Because he is perfect, it's impossible for him to be around anything but perfection. So we're all doomed. Even if you make a 99.5%, you're doomed. And again, let's just be honest. That's straight out. That's, that's kind of where we are. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God, and your sins have made him hide his face from you. So let's get back to our question. Why does God allow evil? Why would God want to hide his face? Why can't he solve this problem where he just looks at everybody and loves them? So happy. Just so happy. No. Because of our sin, he is looking away. He can't even look at sin. He can only see perfection. Another possible reason when we look at this is when you, when you come to the end, there will be a day of judgment. And because of this evil, the condemned will have no right to say that their sentence was unjust. He will be able to show up what I expected, and here's what you did. Here's the, the perfect test with no red marks on it, but 100%. And here's the one that's got the red marks all over it. I set it up. I set up this perfect system, and you messed it up. There's no, no, no opportunity for me to bring you in because this is what happened. God's not going to stop you from exercising your free will. Again, but you think about it. If someone said God should stop all evil and suffering, then should he stop all evil and suffering? We have no problem when it means stopping a, an earthquake in Italy. That's a good thing. God, stop that thing. Don't bring any more earthquakes. Or when somebody murders or rapes someone. But what about when someone thinks of something evil? Some of you may be thinking about evil right to me right now. How do we go to lunch? He's already over my lunchtime. You know, these kind of things. When, the Bible is very clear. If you think it, it's essentially been done. Evil is destructive whether it's acted out or not. Hatred and bigotry in someone's heart is destructive. And it will work its way out. Which person on earth has not thought something evil? You know, I wish that person with the horns, tires would go flat right now at 85 miles an hour. That would be great. I never thought that, but somebody I hear probably thought that. Okay? God allows us to be who we choose to be. And if we choose away from God, our free will allows us to move away from him if we choose. We've earned his judgment. And at the end, the evil will be the opportunity to remind us that here was his perfection and here's where you were. We can dedicate our lives to God and to ourselves either way. Or both have a destiny. We will have earned the destiny. We can't blame God for the judgment. I mean, maybe. Let's go on and try another one in a minute if that doesn't help you. Man rebelled against God. Man came up short. Man finally can be saved. There's hope. Let's look at verse 24. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Again, we always rememorize Romans 23, 23. It's 24 that's the, the positive one. We get the Romans road, 323, you know, 5, 8, 6, 23, Romans 10, 9, and 10. We get all those memorized. And the one that's really got the hope is that 324. Again. We're justified freely by his grace. God saw our separation. He offered us a way to get to God. He offered us grace. We like to couch these words and make them be holy and special. It just means unmerited favor. God had favor upon us when we didn't earn it. None of us have earned it. 
your best acts are filthy rags before the Lord. God offered his son so that we might have life. Therefore, those people in this room right now and around the world and those who have gone before us, who have accepted Christ, are secure. We have hope. We have the ability to just sit and rest and, and, and spend time and commune with God like Adam did in the, the garden. Again, the word redeem is really simple. God redeemed us by his grace and his son. Because of our sin, there was a penalty to be paid. That penalty is separation from God. We know this. We've talked about this. We choose it like we choose our own payments and and we want to be paid. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's got a negative and a positive side. God redeemed us. He paid the debt that we owed and we don't have to be separated from him. Again, you've made a mistake. That one mistake, your first loser now, that one mistake keeps you away. But because of Christ, he paid the debt. We, our debt should have been that we go to hell. We should be separated from God, but Christ took that. He gave his life in, in lieu of ours. And all we have to do is accept that beautiful gift. God is good. We have hope because of Jesus. So again, back to our question. Why does God allow evil? Why doesn't he just stop it? Why bring Jesus into this? Why go through that cross thing, the death? Why does he had, did he have to go through and, and all the apostles go through the problems and lose their lives over the, the time that came up? And when you look at it, and again, most, most of us don't ever want to look at it this way. But when it comes down to it, it's quite possible that God uses evil and suffering to bring people to himself. Have you ever thought about that? I tell you, I've been in a lot of hospitals, and I've been in, in rooms when people have passed away. And it's never my favorite place, but it's a beautiful place to be there with the family and encourage them and love them and pray with them and, and to pray that person into eternity. What a beautiful thing. It's, it's not my favorite. I'd rather us all be healthy and strong and live forever. But we get that. But I've been in so many hospital rooms where I've been the one encouraged. I'm coming in to encourage you. This person's sick. This person's dying. And I'm seeing God. I'm seeing grace. I'm seeing peace. I'm seeing contentment. Yeah, they're suffering. They're not feeling good. But I'm seeing Christ in a way that I've not seen him in a long time. Because of their sweet spirit and their attitude, they just, God's going to work it out. It's all going to be good. I know where I'm going. How you doing? How you doing here, Pastor? What's going on with you? Well, well I got nothing going on compared to you right now. Ah, oh, let's not talk about me. What do you, how you doing? That's sweet. That's encouraging. God can do beautiful things. God, God can do amazing things. Romans, you know, when you look at it, these, these difficulties produce endurance. They give us patience. Romans 5, 3. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our affliction because we know the affliction produces endurance. There are plenty of pastors out there right now saying you should never be sick. You should never have money problems. You should never, whatever it is, add it on the list. Show me anyone in the Bible who went through that. Give me one perfect example, and I'll just start preaching it. We'll probably triple the church tomorrow because that's what people want to hear. They don't want to hear the truth that life is hard. They want to hear the truth that things are probably going to be difficult even if you walk with the Lord. No, tell me things are going to be good and i got a Mercedes coming. That's what I want to hear. It doesn't work that way. When you look at it, God may be able to save people through whatever trial you're going through. How many of us have remembered the story of Joseph? Best story in the whole Bible, and that's the longest. Great story. I mean, you need to read it to your kids. There's several good little movies and videos about it. But you look at it, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was from a wealthy family. He had this coat of many colors, neon and all kinds of sparkles, whatever it is. You know, whatever it is, you want to look at it and write that musical about it. Whatever it is, who knows? But back then, nothing but gray was about all you got. Whatever came off the sheep, that's what you got. And at this point, he's got beautiful colors. They had wealth. They were taken care of. He was loved by his father, and his brothers didn't like it. They sent him off. What they did to Joseph was wrong, and he suffered greatly because of it. But remember the good part of the story. The first half is all the misery he goes through. Go back to Genesis and read the story if you're going through difficult times. Maybe it'll encourage you. The first half of the thing is nothing but bad. 
He's accused of infidelity. He's sent to jail a dozen times. You did this thing and this awful woman. He's around and all these things. But God raised up Joseph in a time of Egypt when, to make provisions for the people when there was going to be no food. Because of Joseph being where he was and, and working his way up and God being patient and in giving him endurance to get through it, he was able to save everyone in that part of the world through the seven-year drought. Not only was Egypt saved, but also Joseph's family, his brothers, who originally sold him into slavery, came in begging him for food. He saved everyone. He became number two in essentially the world at that point. Egypt was it. Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Why can't we have that spirit? Why can't we under the, understand that when we're going through these difficulties, maybe someone's going to see the Lord because of our grace that we show through it? You know, I know many of your, your trials, and I am encouraged when I watch you from a distance and the way that you're just so peaceful and grace-filled through them. I know you're going through tough times, and I'm praying for you when I know these situations. All it does is encourage me and strengthen my faith. Let me be like that person. Lord, please grow me to be like them. But the greatest example of God using evil would be who? Jesus on the cross. Because of that awful thing that happened to an innocent man, you and I have hope. God always has a plan. God always sees the better end. You know, when you look at it, I'd probably say evil is a necessary evil. It allows us to see God. It allows us to experience His presence. It allows us to place trust in Him in a time when there's no place we can place trust. It allows us to rest in Him during the trials. Evil and difficulties allow us to see Him high and lifted up in a way we never would. Evil and difficult times allow us to recognize the power and the, the patience that we can have and the power that God has for us. Difficult times bring us closer to God. I've seen it too many times in ministry where someone becomes all of a sudden they've got money. And what's the first thing they do? They dump church. It's hard not to go to a, a beach house or a mountain house or something when you got one because I'm paying a lot of money to keep that thing running. I better get there on the weekends because I work Monday through Friday. You understand, Pastor, I can't be here all summer. Okay? Go to church somewhere. Spend your time. Spend your gifts. And maybe not spend them on yourself. I had to talk to someone just a week or so ago. They've, they're starting to collect things. Nothing wrong with having some things around. But everything they're collecting is keeping, giving them the opportunity to be away from God. To be away. They've got land forever. They've got vehicles. They've got all these things that... You don't use it your own house. You have to use them hours and hours away. Just kind of indirect value. I know it's not a God to you, but be reminded that God has blessed you, and maybe it's beyond what you need. Maybe there's something that you can do for someone else. All the things that you're accumulating and getting have nothing to do and have no way really to bless your church or the people around you because they're hours and hours away. It's only when we're down and out that we truly see God and we need him. I wish, I don't wish we were down and out, but I think God's bringing that to America. Get us humble again. Maybe. I don't know. Please, Lord, don't give us what we deserve. Again, I'm spitballing this morning. Sadly enough, we're in a world with evil. There's no way around it. And we need to understand that God is good through all of it. And God can bless you through all of it. You may not see it. You're in the dark of the pit. But God is good. 